Hi, I'm so excited to be here today with Professor Robert Thomas, who is joining me from Adam Brooks and Bedford, Cambridge University Hospitals in the UK, where he's coming to talk at GU ASCO 2025 about the gut microbiome and how it relates to prostate cancer. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you for inviting me. Can you tell us a little bit about the gut microbiome and what this prostate cancer connection is as you set us up to understand your study? Well, I believe that the gut microbiome has been sort of overlooked by the health profession for, for years. We know that people who have poor gut health are more likely to feel tired, have cognitive function. There's an increased risk of chronic degenerative diseases such as arthritis, dementia, but also cancer, not only in the gut, but elsewhere in the body, including prostate. But what we don't know is, can we do interventions to improve the gut and actually improve your outcomes? Well, in terms of treatment, we, 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 there are some studies to say that if you have a better gut health, you respond better to the biological agents we're using more and more now, such as pdl one inhibitors, and there's less side effects. Uh, so we sat down with uh, three patient support groups in, in Britain with probably over about 1,000 patients with prostate cancer and says, look, we know gut health is important, and we want to design a study, and they helped us very much with the design of this, which we're very grateful for, which was partly due to the success. We recruited 220 men in, in less than six months, which is amazing. So what we wanted to do is combine a, two nutritional interventions, which had uh, what we call phytochemical-rich foods, such as the things in tomatoes, colorful broccoli, things like that, and combine that with selected prebiotics with the aim to improve gut health and see if that improves their well-being. Uh, and that was a hypothesis for the study. Wonderful. Can you tell us, before we get into the, the outcomes, is it possible to really change the gut microbiome and how effective is that with these prebiotics that you've talked about? Yeah, the gut microbiome is a very dynamic organ. As you know, there's trillions of different healthy bacteria. In fact, there's probably more genetic material from our microbiome than our own cells. So it's not a surprise it really affects us. And things that alter it in a negative way, like having too much sugar, not exercising, taking some antibiotics or being stressed. But there's things which alter it in a very positive way. And one of the things is to eat lots of phytochemical rich foods as I said, things like broccoli, mushrooms, etc., because these act as prebiotics and help to enhance, uh, for want of a better word, the friendly bacteria in, in the gut. There's also evidence that you should be having more uh, bacteria-rich foods, such as fermented foods, kimchi, kefir, kombucha, that sort of thing. And certainly in the British diet, we're quite deficient in those. We don't really eat a lot of that. Uh, so yes, we know there's lots of data, you know, almost on a day-to-day -day basis that the microbiome is changes, and you can certainly enhance it with interventions, and uh, we'll, we'll come on to that for the study as well. Wonderful. So tell me, what did you find in the study? To go back a little bit, what, what we did, we gave every man a, uh, a, a, a phytochemical-rich capsule. So it had six different foods, which were selected based on previous evidence of some effect. Um, and so they all started with that. And then we randomized in a double blind fashion uh, a five blend lactobacillus probiotic, which had things like inulin and a bit of vitamin D, which also acts as a prebiotic actually. Um, so what we looked at was the PSA in the four months before baseline and then four months afterwards. And most men in the study that had um, Cambridge prognostic group one or two, so low risk disease effectively. But um, most were actually progressing. So we were referred from our urological colleagues, patients who were thinking they may need to leave active surveillance. So it's a different group than perhaps your average active surveillance. So the doubling time pre-entry was about 19 months. And after trial entry, it, uh, it extended threefold to 64 months. So there was a very significant slowing, average slowing of PSA. Um, we then looked at the two groups, uh, the randomized groups who had the probiotics or not. And that was where this is, a, I think, a world first. So it's never been actually shown that, um, that if you intervene with a probiotic, you get a further uh, reduction in PSA progression. In fact, the group which had the probiotics and the phytochemicals, actually the PSA fell significantly. 
And the difference in PSA progression, therefore, between the two randomized groups was about 28%, which was highly statistically significant. And all they really had to do was take those probiotics. They took two capsules, one which was a, a, what we call a phytochemical-rich food capsule, and that, that had... But that was the prebiotic that everyone took, or was uh, this... Everyone took that, yes. yes. So everyone took a phytochemical-rich food, uh, which had uh, broccoli, green tea, turmeric, pomegranate, cranberry, and ginger. Yes. And they act as prebiotics, but they also have other benefits. We know they're anti-inflammatory, they enhance antioxidant pathways, etc. And then they were randomized to the probiotics, the actual bacteria, the healthy bacteria. But then the group that had the most prolongation, all they had to do was add that extra probiotic. Um, and what, what did that look like on a, on a daily consumption basis? Uh, basically, it was just two capsules just of two both, capsules. and they just took it with their meals, which was very well tolerated. We had about 6% said they got a bit of initial bloating, which is common if you take probiotics, but more patients said they got, felt better. Uh, but as well as PSA, which was great to see, and the men were very encouraged by this, uh, for the first time we actually showed that there was a reduction in urinary symptoms. So there was about a 25% improvement in urinary symptoms, such as getting up at night or urgency. And there was a small benefit in erectile dysfunction as well. And that just goes to show that the overall well-being of men in the study was being improved by this. So it's nice to have a natural intervention which actually improves well-being. I'm not saying we do this instead of drugs, but most of the drugs we give have side effects and it doesn't improve well-being, but uh, that's the advantage of doing sort of lifestyle nutritional interventions. Very, very interesting. Do you have any information on whether there was a difference between the groups in terms of their receipt of definitive therapy, since you said that they were essentially an active surveillance group that was coming up on perhaps needing definitive therapy? So, most of the men in the study were actually progressing at trial entry with a PSA doubling time of about 19 months. So they were already thinking of leaving active surveillance before they started. Now, in the actual uh, phytochemical-rich supplement and probiotic group, the PSA actually fell. And this was supported by MRI changes, which showed no, no change. Um, so it was very clear to me that this would persuade more men to stay on active surveillance. Nevertheless, we put this back to the patient support group and they uh, unanimously agreed that that would be reassuring to them. But in terms of actual hard data, at the end of the four months, there were eight patients who actually opted for radiotherapy or surgery in uh, the placebo group and there was one in the intervention group. Now, as a scientific committee, we decided not to actually analyze that statistically because we feel it's a bit... It's a bit early. It was only a four-month intervention. So men have been given the supplements now, both supplements to take, and we're going to look and to see if there's any actual objective changes in their choices six months to a year down the line, which we think is a much more accurate reflection of what's going on. So what that means for us as doctors and patients is that more men are going to stay on active surveillance, avoiding the toxicity of, say, radiotherapy or surgery or even hormones in some case, and even possibly saving money for, for the NHS or other health providers. That's wonderful. My final question is really around those symptoms that I think are probably patient-reported symptoms, erectile function and some others. Was there a difference between the groups or was that within the entire study, those things changed from baseline? Uh, well, it was, it, it was in, we looked at them be four months before and at baseline and asked after. And for the symptoms, we did the whole group, actually. Um, the, there was, uh, so there was definitely a, about a 25% improvement in symptoms from baseline to the end of the study. Uh, we didn't actually look to see if there was any difference between the two groups. Um, so that's maybe something we should be looking at. Okay, wonderful. So if you had a final message to tell viewers, because some of these things are probably you know, lifestyle interventions that are available to individuals, people, to clinicians right now, what would your message be? Well, men are very interested in self-help strategies. We know that over 75% take a supplement of some sort, uh, but they do crave having uh, robust data such as this in a double-blind randomized trial. So I think this trial very clearly says we should be advising men, or they'll find out the results themselves, 
to take lots of phytochemical rich foods, lots of herbs, spices, colorful foods. And if they want to take a supplement, we now know there's evidence for certain types. Um, and there's lots of supplements out there who've got no evidence. It also, for the first time, shows that gut health is also very important, not just to make you feel better and give you more energy, but actually to slow down the rate of your prostate cancer progression. So, you know, eat your kimchi, drink your kefir, uh, stop having so much processed sugar, exercise. These things really matter for your gut health, and it will slow down the rate of progression. Well, that's, that's so exciting, so interesting that there was a longer time to that PSA rise uh, and certainly encouraging for people who are on active surveillance to continue that process, but also consider these lifestyle interventions as, as something that might really make a difference in their long-term follow-up. Thank you so much for your time and for your expertise. Thank you.